okay so welcome you all uh, so uh, for our uh, you know 60th year of institute of mathematical sciences so we have today a distinguished speaker professor shogato bose from university college london uh, so shogato is known to uh, several of us he visited this institute also in some conferences sometime back uh i know him personally for a long time uh so shogato is well known for his work in uh, quantum information optics and related issues so uh, you know he did his phd uh during 96 to 99 in imperial college london under the guidance of professor uh, um, you know peter knight is a well known person in quantum optics and uh, currently he is a professor in the university college london so uh, shogato has lots of awards you know i can't finish all of them so for example he has this erc starting grant uh, from september 2017 then maxwell medal and prize in 2008 uh, royal society also on research merit in 2000 from October 2007 to September 2012 EPSRC advanced research fellowship in physics um then this uh, so actually he has also got this uh, offer satish dhawan chair from iisc but due to pandemic he couldn't join maybe later he will join there as a visiting chair um so he supervised several phd students and postdocs uh and i mean uh, a lot of them has become faculty not only faculty even professors and they are also quite well known in their own field um uh so and shogato has you know he has done pioneering works in this field called quantum spin chain and their information transfer and in recent times he has been into this area of uh, probing quantumness of gravity uh so uh so without much ado i request sugar to to start his colloquy okay thank you thank you shivashish for uh, the invitation and and also quite uh, elaborate uh, introduction um uh, so imsc uh, has very fond memory i have very fond memories of imsc because in uh, 1995 i first visited uh, still as a as a fourth year student in iit kharagpur and i was uh, so working so my my supervisor there was uh, professor simon i don't know whether he still comes in but um, yeah so i i i spent the summer uh, there with uh, simon in 1995 and Uh, i probably gave my first uh, ever uh, talk uh, in one of the msc auditoriums okay um okay so today's so it's 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 very nice to uh, see that so i i was not aware that my site is so old so it's 60 years is uh, quite a bit uh, right yeah that is good to see okay um so i have i i am coming to this topic mainly from um, i would say uh, a mixture of uh, quantum information quantum computation quantum optics direction and we were in the business of trying to create uh, macroscopic superpositions to 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 probe the boundaries of quantum mechanics and then we realized at some point that this could also uh, shed uh, light to the question as to whether gravity is quantum or classical okay so it's uh, it's not what is the quantum theory of gravity that that of course we cannot uh, say anything about at at the scales we are working but uh, it's still an interesting question as it can settle if, if there are people who believe that gravity may still be classical right so that these things can be disproved using uh, this kind of experiment okay but uh, i'll i'll go to more details gradually okay so let me start the talk so part of it uh, initially will be a, a motivating part right and then uh, i will go to describe the experiment and then in the end i will spend a little bit more time to recap the motivation okay before before ending okay so first of all what are we looking at here okay so as i said 
Um, first of all, can you hear me all right? Because I'm sometimes reclining and, and my, my, my video is the same as my microphone. Uh, is it, all right, right? You can hear me? Shivashish, yeah. Mm. So the, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, if I have to be louder, I have to be closer to the, 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 the video as well as the audio. Okay. Um, anyway, I go on. I mean, if you and, and feel free to stop and interrupt uh, and ask me question at uh, any stage. Okay, uh, I think uh, if you raise hands in the audience, I may barely just be able to see some some of you, but not not exactly. All. It is very small. Um, so, but I, I may yeah just just interrupt and ask me any question. Okay. Now, as I said, uh, I am. Um, was in the business of creating superpositions of uh, a large mass here and there. This is a picture of that. But you see, when the mass is large enough, it will also uh, create a superposition of uh, its uh, associated gravitational field, okay, which can be centered at, at uh, this left point or this right point. Okay? What with this quantum plus, okay, quantum superposition, and this is exactly what we want to verify. Okay, the quantum superposition between these, uh, not just the mass being here and there, but also its associated gravitational field being centered around here and centered around there. Okay. But you know how notoriously difficult it is to verify this quantum plus, okay, the superposition. Okay, It is not a one basis test. So for example, if you were to bring a second mass to probe it, the, and, and then measure that, okay, that mass will deflect, uh, have say, less acceleration in this scenario, if it's somewhere here, more slightly more acceleration in this scenario, but that is what we would call a single basis measurement, okay? Right, for example, just whether it's left or right, some kind of uh, coarse grain position basis measurement, right? And that is not enough to verify superposition. As we know, to verify superposition, you need measurements in multiple bases, okay? At the same time, this first mass is already involved. So what happens is what, what turns out eventually is the only way to really verify that such a superposition is existing is to test for an entanglement between two masses. Okay, in that way, you can probe multiple bases and verify that this gravitational field was indeed in a coherent superposition of being centered left and centered right. Okay? This is um, the the relativists view, okay? So the, the relativists like to view, uh, um, you know, gravitation as, 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 as a, but well, not like, I mean, it's, 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 it's a correct way of interpreting it as, as a curvature of uh, space time. And then uh, this is the, this is the kind of superposition of different space times that we are uh, Kato, verifying. I have, okay. a, yeah. sure. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Even without bringing the distortion of the space, Mm -hmm. Creating a coherent superposition of two mass, one massive object is a mm -hmm. hard thing, right? So, right, right. Experimentally, that's like a Schrodinger cat state. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, in addition, now you want you want to carry the distortion, also space time distortion around the mass. Exactly, exactly. So, the Schrodinger cat state automatically couples to the gravitational field as well, and and it's sourced it it's sourced in to the left or sourced to the right. So, but what about the experimental status without bringing in uh, gravitational yes, distortion? For example, how heavy masses can be created in a superposed state? Right, right. So at the moment, the status is uh, uh, rather poor from the point of view of what I'm going to say. But uh, we have, as I said, I mean, a large part of my talk will be devoted to how one may be able to do that, right, uh, to larger masses. So at the moment, the record is about... 10 to the power of four atomic mass units, okay? So about thousand carbon atoms kind of thing, okay? So they have done with large uh, organic molecules, okay? But we are going to make a big jump. We are going to use nanocrystals essentially. And for nanocrystals, people have recently made a, a, a lot of progress, but not yet superposition, but they have kind of prepared uh, nice starting states to work go for that and we are actually for for gravity to be significant we are going to need micro crystals so micron sized crystals so so it's one more step okay but i will i will tell some 
you know, uh, schemes to be, and, and, and the conditions required for realizing them. So they are very hard. They're very hard, but they are, you know, not that much harder than, say, uh, uh, so what uh, you know, LIGO used to be when first presented or something like that. So it's going to require a lot of effort, but uh, there, there are clear um, goals to meet, which one can do. It's, it's not uh, unfeasible. It, we don't need like a galaxy side ex size accelerator or something, but we need a lot of very good vacuum, very good cryogenics. And, and, uh, but, but we also know those tempers and pressures. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you, okay? So let me make that clear as it goes on, okay? Um, okay, so now the, just uh, during the motivation, there is a somewhat uh, more uh, intuitive and easier way to motivate this also. This is uh, the kind of the field theorists, um, you know, quantum field theorists viewpoint. So, you know, all the experiments we are going to conduct in the end are in a very weak gravity. Newtonian gravity can always be regarded as a small change on Minkowski space-time, okay, on flat space-time. So it is quite all right at that scale to view uh, gravity as just, uh, you know, a spin two field uh, in flat space-time, okay? Just like you think of electromagnetic field as a spin one field, it's just a spin two field, okay? And in that regime, what we are trying to test is, uh, you see, say, say two masses, M1 and M2, right? They can either uh, interact by exchange of quanta, okay? In this case, these are, of course, virtual quanta. These are not on shell. You integrate them over all possible energies, right? That's true, that I accept. But some quantum exchange going on, okay? Or whether the masses are uh, interacting through some classical, uh, you know, fields. Okay, and these are the two cases that we can differentiate. Okay, in the former case you can entangle the masses, and in the latter case you cannot. Okay, because only you have to think, see in the following point of view: what is the classical field in the end? The classical field is something which can have fixed values at different point of, uh, points in uh, space, right? So those fixed values uh, will only appear to the second mass as kind of a unitary operation happening on it alone, okay? And those kind of things cannot entangle. Okay? Again, these will be uh, clarified slightly uh, later, but what we are trying to see through this experiment is whether gravity is really qualitatively different because, you know, in the end, it is the geometry of space time whether it is always classical entity, completely different kind of thing, or at least, you know, it is very similar to the other forces. And uh, in the low energy limit, uh, it can be, you know, viewed as uh, like other forces. And so whether, so we can test this through the entanglement, okay. Um, at the outset, I would tell you, okay, so maybe maybe I'll tell a bit more uh, later, okay? And but, but, but just to emphasize that some people prefer this picture that we are proving this superposition along with the distortion of space-time around, or some people uh, would may be better, um, you know, uh, at home with this picture, but they are kind of, they are equally, not kind of, they are exactly equivalent at, in the regime that I'm speaking about, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Now, how do we entangle? So this is the main thing we kind of, I think we cracked a few years ago because what is shown here is not how to do it, okay? This is a very poor way of doing it, okay? So you have a mass centered here and a mass centered closer to a second probe mass, okay? The acceleration is really for the kind of masses, the best like micron size masses I was talking about, okay? Is 10 to the power minus 16 meter per second square. Okay. So even in one second, you would get just 10 to the power minus 16 difference between uh, the mass here and there. So this is definitely not how to entangle well. Okay, So the, uh, the these, um, 10 to the power minus 16 is even smaller than the ground state spread of this very light uh, micron sized particles if you trap them a certain well. Okay? So, so this is not even, uh, this, this is hardly significant, this entanglement. Okay. This is why our methodology is to create two superpositions okay, and entangle more by using uh, techniques which we are using uh, the field of uh, quantum computation. Okay. 
And so now I will describe this a bit more. Um, the, the first the experiment I'll describe a bit more uh, abstractly. Okay. Uh, the, then I will describe it more uh, concretely. Okay. Sorry, not abstractly. Um, I'm schematically. I would say yes, schematically. So suppose, and I, I will say later how to do it. Uh, suppose we have created a superposition of um, a mass on the left as L1 and R1 and another mass on the right L2 and R2. Okay, so we have created these two uh, superpositions. Okay, and uh, we uh, hold them um, for a while. Okay, uh, uh, next to each other. Okay, now I'm using the word hold them is, is probably a bad word. So actually they would be in the real experiment, they would be freely falling next to each other. Okay. But anyway, let's go. Just imagine that this is a picture which is still for some time t. Okay, there's a center separation d, and there's a superposition size delta x. So each mass has been displaced by delta x. Okay. Um, so this, this, uh, in in fact, so our paper appeared in 2017. But I just want to emphasize something here because there was also some work in parallel. We were doing this work for quite a while, including, in fact. Most of the collaborators were also involved already for three, four years before that. First time I gave this talk was also in India in uh, ICTS. Okay, and there's a video <laughs> proof of that. But somehow the, in 2017, when we published, we had uh, another paper at the same time by another group. But anyway, let, let me proceed to the, the idea. Okay? So you have held these uh, two, two masses in superposition next to each other. Okay. Now, what will happen? What will be the evolution? Okay, so um, they will interact. So suppose you have um, ensured that they are far enough apart for electromagnetic interactions not to happen. Okay, this uh, involves some distances. I'll come to hundreds of microns separation, and force requires neutrality. Requires no multiples inside. So it's it's a it's a challenging thing to achieve, but suppose you have achieved that, okay. So they are only interacting gravitationally. Okay. Then what will happen is there will be this phase evolution, okay. So you know L L L R R L R R. Okay. So there are, there is this R L component which has the smallest distance. So this will gather phase at the fastest rate because the denominator T minus delta X is the, the smallest. Okay. And then the others will also gain phase at a slower rate. Okay. Uh, now, this is very similar to, uh, in, in some sense, uh, so this is exactly what we call a controlled Z gate, the, or the, action, the, the things required for a control Z or CZ or control phase gate in, uh, in quantum computation. And, and this interaction is very similar to an Ising interaction. Okay. So, because one, so it would be exactly an Ising interaction if we were actually considering the masses uh, parallel to each other. Okay, somehow in the original paper, we considered this setting, but this setting also works, okay? Then of course, these interact slightly different than those, okay? So, so you know, to, um, so this is really an interaction which you can very effectively use to evolve phases, okay? And then now I'll show how these phases will entangle, okay? So suppose these phases are there. So there's a common phase, left, left, and right, right, which are the same. So left, left, and right, right will get the same phase. So you can subtract that out. Okay. Um, when you take that common, you will see that the, the things partnered are this delta phi left, right, and delta phi right, left. Okay. Now these phases need not be the same because right, left will be a much larger phase than left, right. Okay, uh, so uh, it, and and you can see that this is an entangled state. So if you take out the L, its partner, and if you take out the R, its partner are just different states for any delta phi L R and delta phi R R L. Unless I mean, for certain values they may be same, but generically they are the different. Okay, and they are even orthogonal when these things add up to pi. Okay, so the, we would say that the state has become what we call maximally entangled when they are uh, equal to pi. Okay? So this is the better way to entangle masses through this phase evolution, okay? Because what's happening here is here, the H bar is helping us, you see? So the, the rate of phase evolution is, we are just using E equal to H bar omega here, okay? So the omega is, uh, 
yeah, so, so from the energy, we are dividing by h bar to get the omega. So that is using a huge amplification of the effect, okay? So, uh, so we can now consider a very special case, okay? Where the right left is much less separation than the other possibilities. Say we take, take left and right, left one and right, R two very far, okay? You consider two static particles, you split them, maybe just bring two of them close to scatter and take back, yeah? In an ideal situation, okay? so we we will we will of course not achieve such a thing. So we will do exact calculations as well. But consider for the moment that these were so large that you only had one phase to consider, right? Uh, the right left, okay. The others are negligible. Then what are the numbers, okay? What are the numbers then, okay? But there is one big prohibition, okay. So we have we have to know what is the smallest d minus delta x you can do. Okay? So what is the least d minus delta x you can bring things close to? Okay. So here, we our hands are a little bit tied, okay? So as I said, um, say, say you ensure that you have neutral masses, okay? These my experimentalist friends can ensure exceptionally uh, well these days, those who work in the field of trapping, uh, you know, nanocrystals and microcrystals, because they want to char they want to detect e by 10 and those kinds they want to find out milli milli charged uh, objects so they they exceptionally well they neutralize uh, objects uh, they shine they just, just shine uv light to the enclosure or to the object depending on the charge and you know the, the charge flows and uh, you know they gets neutralized so the overall neutrality is good okay of course there could be charge multiples inside a crystal okay that uh, we have, um, so you just need exceptionally good single crystals uh, where you do not have any patch potentials or anything, any, any places for charge traps and things. Um, nano single crystals may just be possible. Even micro single crystals uh, is, is something one should aim for. Otherwise, uh, I will tell you later, we can physically spin to average out uh, the multiples. We have not yet done that calculation, but that it is also possible. So suppose for the moment there are no charge multiples inside either, okay? But this still doesn't solve because there's still induced, you know, vacuum induced dipole, vacuum induced dipole interactions between these dielectric objects. We will have dielectric objects, not even conductors, okay? But but there will still be these Casimir interactions and and there is very little freedom here, you see, aside the distance, okay? Because, um, in, you know, the Casimir interaction also will depend on the, the radius of the objects and uh, in normal density of materials, okay? We will use a diamond crystal, okay? Where, well, I mean, how, how you, you cannot really realistically go to much larger densities, maybe 10 times at best. So, so we kind of come to quite a fundamental, uh, restriction here if we are not using any screening then um, at least uh, you know uh, this is Planck mass square and this is density square so so you typically have to be 200 microns separate okay so this lowest smallest distance is uh, let's say this is about 100 microns so order of magnitude okay then if you put those things we get this wonderful um, you know uh, this is this is the main realization I would say when we wrote our paper. Okay, um, that if you take these micron size spheres, micron size spheres are 10 to the power minus 14 kgs. Okay, you can just take density of diamond, silicon, everything will have very similar. It's 10 to the power minus 14 kg uh, sphere. Um, and uh, then you just put those numbers here. G is, for a theorist, capital G is 10 to the power minus 10, okay, in SI units, MKS units, okay? Uh, and then this is 10 to the power minus 34 H bar. Uh, if you put all those, you see uh, for 100 microns, uh, you know, you get a uh, unit phase shift in uh, one second, okay? So it's a hard rate experiment, okay? So this entanglement will happen um after one second it will become like maximally entangled okay um, of course when we really use uh, 200 microns and we use that these uh, splittings are also off the order of 100 microns uh, then then we get a slightly slower rate of rate of growth but not that much uh, different okay so it's still it becomes few seconds okay uh, 
maybe so also some uh, somewhat later people uh, uh, kind of recasted our work uh, in in a slightly different way uh, to prove that it was kind of demonstrating the superposition of space time so kind of more the, the first picture that i showed um and uh, that's another way to understand why uh, okay so my my way of understanding is simply that planck's constant being small is fighting another constant which is small okay? and, and and we are getting a good number here but another way to think is that our masses being micron size crystals now uh, it's kind of approaching the planck mass okay uh, of course, still many orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck mass, but that is more than compensated by the our one second experiment in which light travels a long distance. So, so this is this is just the Newtonian uh, expression rewritten. Okay. Now, this is the entangling uh, mechanism. Uh, uh, Sorry, one... I had. To... Could he sure, ask sure. a? Clarifying question. So if for this limit, D minus delta X much less than D and delta X, the two LR systems are overlapping. Right, right. So so let me take you to the previous picture. Yeah. So so these are not, not really, oh yeah, we cannot really make them fully overlap. We have to keep this kind of 200 micron separation. Okay. But they are getting closest and, and these are, are very far. So one of their components are coming as close as uh, they can come without electromagnetism you know, kicking in. So what is D? D is actually the separation of the centers of the two superpositions. Okay? And delta X is the size of the individual superpositions. So as we, as we are increasing delta X, D is also increasing. So I'm wondering whether D minus, minus delta X can be much smaller than D. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so delta X, you see delta X by two is kind of uh, coming into the, uh, you know, so, 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 D, so, so this is, this distance is, this is D, this is delta X by two, say from the center, and this is delta X by two from the center. I mean, even if M1 and M2 are side by side, then D will be delta X, same as delta X. So that is the and limit. That are, is when that middle M1 and M2 are very close to each other, then D will be close to delta X. So that is the limit you are taking. Uh, uh, so D is between the centers of the uh, things, okay? And, and delta X is, this is like delta X by two, this is delta X by two. Can you, yeah, can you so see that my is, car, sir? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah okay. I, 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 am, I understand the limit. And also yeah. this delta phi r, l r that you are taking, it is the Newtonian, you are using Newtonian gravity. Absolutely, for computation purposes, okay? But we have to have in mind, again, I'll go to maybe these discussions again later because they often come out uh, in the end of talks, but maybe it's good to emphasize at this point also. So uh, Newtonian, uh, it's it's a limit, okay? It's a, it's it's the, the you know, at, at our, our scale, so things, this is the only thing which is, uh, you know, going to give any relevant phase. So we fully uh, understand and uh, we can model, we have modeled, others have also modeled this experiment uh, using fully uh, relativistic as well as uh, quantum uh, treatment, okay? Um, uh, so one point in the quantum treatment is important for us that there is a mediator, okay? Um, and then we uh, we just use this for the maths, okay? Because in the end, the maths will be, uh, the, it will come out to be the neutron interaction. So we are just uh, using it uh, to compute our uh, growth of entanglement. But I'm using the neutron yeah. interaction. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, So, Hello. Yeah. So you mentioned like uh, E is equal to H omega one relation. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Definitely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. H is like Planck constant, and uh, what is omega here? Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. No, no. Yeah, I was just using. So oh, it's the frequency, angular frequency. Yeah. So it is like uh, yeah. related to the gravitational wave frequency. No, 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 no. Sorry, not at all. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, this omega is the growth of, uh, is the frequency of our phase evolution. Okay. There's no gravitational waves here. Yeah. This is, um, so the, the, there are no, no on-shell gravitons here. Okay. 
Okay, so, so there are uh, no gravitons being created except those which are created from vacuum fluctuations and images. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. so therefore, from this vacuum fluctuation, there is no phase fluctuation here. It's like a no. fixed phase. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, the phase is not fluctuating. No, no. It's a steady growth of phase. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you can think of the charge counterpart, it will be exactly, you create two charges in superposition, the Coulomb field will be, you know, much stronger here and you will have a growth of, uh, you know, uh, entanglement. Yeah, like, the main thing is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we compare this like uh, uh, electromagnetic radiations, so like quantized radiation. Hmm. So um, uh, maybe I'll make some comments later on uh, when we create the superposition or bring it back, then there will be some radiation, but this is very weak, uh, exceptionally weak for uh, gravity here. Okay, so it doesn't doesn't decohere us, doesn't bother us. You know. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so now again back to um, some of the logic. Uh, so it may be, you know, it may be very clear to many of you. So don't, uh, so so I don't want to be, uh, but I'm being a bit pedantic because at the end of all my talks, I again end up fighting about these points. Okay, so I'm just uh, clarifying this from say very basic. So how we do gates in quantum computing, for example. Okay, this is uh, arguably now the main mechanism of doing gates uh, between qubits. Okay, say superconducting qubits, for example. So this this experiment was done with atomic qubits uh, flying through a, a microwave cavity, okay? These days, these microwave cavities have become strip line resonators and these atoms have been replaced by, you know, superconducting uh, qubits, okay? But essentially the maths is the same, okay? So you have, main thing is that you do not have direct action at a distance, okay? So this is something we have to accept for even for the premise of our experiment, for the justification to grow through, that Newtonian interaction is not action at a distance, that there is no action at a distance in this world, okay? So it's uh, local interaction of the qubit here with the local field, okay? That's something you have to accept, okay? Now, if you have this qubit interacting with this microwave resonator, another qubit in microwave resonator, you slightly detune them. So this is kind of the Hamiltonian, okay? So the, there's a photon created here, okay? If the atom goes from a ground state to excited state, you can think of the atom going from the ground state to excited state a bit like, uh, you know, this um, one of the legs of the tree level diagram I showed, okay? It's exactly that because, uh, you know, any, 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 uh, any spin is like two harmonic oscillators. So you can think, yeah, so uh, one oscillator eliminated, another created, and then this, Photon is the one going from there. Okay, so as you know, so this is the so this is the interaction term, and this will be the first order term if you if you are doing um, you know perturbative expansion Dyson series. But if this detuning is large enough, this term goes away, and we know it is the second order term, the second order term in the Dyson series, which really results in a flip flop interaction. Okay, so the energy is exchanged due to the 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 this cavity which is uh, you know linking them being virtually populated okay? this is exactly how gravity is also happening in vacuum okay so the vacuum of the gravitational field is never populated there are two masses okay and the energy of the vacuum is different according to where the masses are because the vacuum is you know virtually populated and some exchange is going on okay so, uh, so, so this is how all interactions appear in nature. In quantum computation, of course, we want to direct the interaction. So we use fewer modes and uh, directed uh, thing. Okay? Now, uh, what is hidden here is, so though we have, so you see the evidence of this mediator somehow goes away. Okay? And this is probably the, the problem where the problem becomes slippery, you know, so the, the, so it's an indirect, so if I were to find entanglement between these two qubits, even if this resonator was always in vacuum, I have to conclude that this resonator was a quantum link, or this resonator was quant allowed quantized field modes, okay? If I don't allow that, you see that there is a, a dagger equal to identity hiding inside when you do that 
second order term in the Dyson series, okay, it does come with that. It's just that it becomes identity, so it drops out of the interaction. Okay, it becomes identity is a way to check that your calculation has been correct. Almost always that happens. Then you have what is called a coherent interaction, but a coherent interaction requires a quantum mediator. Okay. So without a quantum mediator, you do not have a coherent interaction. So when we think sigma dot sigma between distant, uh, you know, uh, spins, okay, there must be a coherent interaction. Okay. Of course, we know when we have neighboring spins, this mechanism is slightly different. The object, the, the electron itself moves, okay. Uh, but but when you are further, say, take dipolar interaction or whatever, it's through the electromagnetic field mediator, and, and that's that remains in the vacuum. Okay. So I just want to. Uh, emphasize this point because this is essentially what we are trying to do. Now, one may say, has that thing been exchanged? Was it quantum or not? So if, if it was classical, you will never create an entanglement. Okay? And though we are using, mathematically, we are using this formula of Newtonian formula, okay, action at a distance kind of formula. We have to understand that fundamentally it is coming from a vertex like that, from two vertices, okay, through a, a tree level diagram. Okay? And, and this is what we are using. So, so now you see, I, I showed you this mechanism of entangling, okay? So if we generate this entanglement and successfully verify that we do have this entanglement, then we can conclude that whatever has gone between them must be quantum, okay? Uh, let me clarify a bit more uh, here, why, okay? Um, uh, so, um, so, so first of all, uh, so what our experiment relies on, okay, so there's a limitation to moving masses very fast and stuff, so we cannot do, A, we cannot do anything relativistic really within the experiment, okay, you cannot see retardation uh, effects and things like that within the setting of our experiment, okay, so essentially the locality of uh, the locality of interactions uh, has to be assumed, has to be taken from other experiments in nature, okay? We know nature is local, okay? Nature is not non-local uh, and it comes from relativity, okay? Uh, so, so this is an assumption. Here, H mu nu is a weak, um, you know, weak perturbation on the Minkowski uh, field. So this is, this is the gravitational um, field, okay, for us, okay? And this is the source. Okay, this is the energy momentum tensor. So this local, the same R and T are there. Okay, so nature is local. Okay, that is an uh, assumption we are taking from all other experiments we have done. We do not, we cannot prove this within our experiment. Some people demand that you also prove this from our experiment, that it's not action at a distance. That we cannot do. Okay, this is an assumption going into the experiment. Okay. So if you assume that, okay, that's an assumption. And then we have to also assume a definition of what we mean by classical field, okay? So, so uh, what should we mean by classical field? Something which fills up all, you know, all points in uh, space and time with a specific number, okay? That's a classical field, okay? Uh, you can also have different quantum states with different probabilities and suppose they correspond to different uh, classical fields, that's also allowed. So we are fully allowed stochasticity and fluctuations, okay? Again, as I said, we must remember just stochasticity and fluctuations alone are not quantum, okay? That is uh, statistical classical uh, physics, okay? But when you have the fluctuations in more than one non-commuting variable, right? Then it is quantum, right? So, so, so we are fully allowing um, the um, you know the field to exist as as numbers. So so this is say the the field quad h j mu nu is the field quadrature. Okay, it's not it's a momentum quadrature. Say so it's like it's like it's position quadrature. If you if you know about electromagnetic fields, you will understand what I'm speaking here. Okay, so and and that that has specific values. Okay, and of course, but the states of the systems which are sourcing that I, I, I am assuming can be arbitrary quantum states, okay? So, and then for each quantum state, you can have only certain classical, say, um, you know, uh, geometry associated, with it, classical field associated with it, can be happen with arbitrary probabilities, okay? So these are our only two assumptions, the definition of classical physics, definition of classical field is exactly now how we define a classical field when we learn classical electromagnetism, okay? Uh, value of E, value of B, fixed values at specific points, so it's like a value, 
specific value of h mu nu at every point yeah, yeah. so uh, so the, just one clarification so usual argument that uh, is given in the context of perturbative quantum gravity is that if the source has some uncertainty then the gravitational field that is that is being produced will also have some uncertainty correct okay so, so that's part of part of that uncertainty i have included okay um, say say i've in included that uncertainty in one basis i would say in kind of the position basis or some basis you can include that uncertainty so when you that's say uh, hj mu nu for the for the specific uh, source state exactly how 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 is hj mu nu how is yeah how how can you determine yeah. that without an uncertainty yeah. yeah exactly so 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 uh, essentially that's a good question so we we are trying to do the the thing quite um, agnostic to that okay so it may be any method yeah you, you often people follow the newton schrodinger method like take an average of mod psi square or something but we are not subscribing to any particular method okay so h j mu nu is a function of this j j using you know whatever you like but it must be kind uh, local okay Uh, so it's 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 very general the correspondence okay we are, we are not committing to any particular thing here okay our proof will still go through uh, as long okay. as that is that is local but i should I just so, say that it should also be a local rule yeah uh, i see so there is a method which i am not familiar probably but uh, if you have multiple proposals all of them will satisfy einstein's equations um okay no that's a very good question so i think you are probably also restricted to, in terms of uh, what you can use in this mapping okay uh, my yeah. argument is uh, uh, more general than that so of I course see. it will be valid for the subset but but uh, that's a very good thing uh, you know so so i think einstein's equations might only be satisfiable from um, something of uh, this averaging like newton schrodinger type though that has pathological problems quantum mechanically it's, it's a non linear theory so it leaves faster than light signaling so it's kind of wrong quantum mechanically one can have stochastic versions of newton schrodinger maybe that is the only allowed one i don't know that that is something to check what is what freedom is there okay we will not require to make that assumption say our argument is going through okay. as long as it's local but okay. yeah. just to try to understand the question that you are un- asking i have been waiting to understand that maybe i'll ask okay, okay. here uh, you okay. know uh, so uh, if i understand i mean i'm not an expert of the experimental setup and various other terminology that you have mentioned but mm-hmm. if you are saying that uh, just like if for two charged particle uh, they are interacting with say, f- in terms of, uh, uh, by exchanging photons in that case if you perform an experiment and determine that photon is a quantum thing and then you replicate the same thing by neutralizing the sources and therefore only interaction that is taking place is gravita- gravitational and mm-hmm. conceptually you are doing the same thing to determine Absolutely. whether gravity is uh, quantum or classical Absolutely. now that right. that that goes uh, uh, that is perfectly aligned with the usual perturbative quantum gravity problem and in that case uh, you have already identified a classical part which satisfies einstein's equations and uh, then there is a quantum part and determining uh, that quantum fluctuation is a planck scale phenomenon and which we are saying that in your experiment you don't have to go to a very big accelerator or or something like that but in your experiment you can find that uh, you can uh, okay. show whether the quantum nature exists or not is yeah, that yeah, right yeah 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 that's right modulo this thing is what i mean by quantum nature is is uh, very different from what uh, others mean by quantum so you see i i put in the word nature there okay um, mm-hmm. so so what i mean by quantum nature is for something to something to have the ability to exist in a quantum superposition you see like the very first picture i showed okay or or to be able to go between objects through superposition of many energy states like the virtual uh, thing uh, that i showed so 
it does not, uh, so for ability of something to be quantum, it's a, it's a qualitative aspect and that can be checked at low energies as well. So if the, if the, if the object requires an Hilbert space to be described, right? Uh, or or, or uh, whether, uh, so, so it is not finding effects which you do not find uh, in um, low energy theory. Okay, so we will never be able to identify through these methods um, the you know any any hint of any uh, blank skin corrections or even I will show it better in some slides uh, later perhaps that also uh, quantum corrections uh, even even relativistic corrections uh, so post Newtonian either relativistic or quantum extremely difficult okay but. At the Newtonian tree level diagram, often people think tree level, say tree level diagram is classical, right? That, that's, that's also one terminology people use. I am looking at the fundamental mechanism here, and that is not classical because there's a quantum thing going between. And this is what we can verify, uh, yeah, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in a field theory language. In a, in a relativistic language, we can verify the superposition of different uh, space times, which can definitely happen at low energy. You put something here and put something there, right? So this, this aspect, which is very different from what people often uh, call quantum gravity, right? So this is, this is important to emphasize that we are- I see, okay. Uh, so eventually, whatever result you get, we have to translate that back in terms of the standard quantum gravity discussions that, you know, yeah, that community yeah. has. So that has to be done. It is not fully clear exactly how to relate yeah. this. To. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it will be actually, so the results are fully consistent with standard, you know, quantum gravity. Um, so, so, uh, so the experiment may have very less surprise for um, people uh, other than those who really believe gravity is classical okay that is that is where the surprise will be that cannot exist in such a superposition or something like that okay so it will kill the possibility of uh, semi classical it will prove semi classical gravity to be wrong even at this low energy scales okay by semi classical i mean classical gravity and quantum matter Okay, 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 fine. Thank you. Uh, so, so got to, I think, uh, Ganeshan Dati has Hello? a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ganesh. okay, please, yeah, please ask. Yeah. Small question. You have taken the interaction as H mu times T mu. Uh, yeah. As far as the Newtonian potential is concerned, I could very well take it to be exchanged by a scalar particle. So, it could be right. five times some J. So, uh, then asking question for uh, Einstein's theory, etc., is uh, immature at this level, isn't it? You yeah, so I will tensor or uh, scalar. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is, there is the the mm, there there can be uh, spin zero particles exchange virtual ones as well as spin two particles exchange virtual ones. Um, they will uh, give uh, different. So, so when spin two are exchanged, they will give some momentum dependent interactions rather than uh, you know uh, just a source energy dependent interactions. Uh, so yeah, so so all the components are there even for the virtual particles. When when you take the on shell counterparts radiation, then only the spin two is there. Yeah, the, the scalar. Right. Is so there. that is why I'm asking question that if you are using Newtonian potential in the calculations, then mm -hmm. that will not distinguish it. It's true in general. Of course, one can distinguish it. That is certainly true. Right. Right. But so we not the radiation effects in such things in the experiments. So therefore, experiment is. Uh, Sort of blind to this feature, isn't it? I, I would say so. In, uh, so experiment, I, I, as I also show with the side, so experiment in principle is not blind to that, but in practice is blind to yeah, that. Yeah, right. at, the, at the moment, so at the level, you are not able to distinguish between the two. At some level, no. only, but right now it is not possible. No. no. Yeah. Uh, I was asking about the definition, uh, uh, how exactly in principle one is defining. That's the question I was asking. That will be for us to wait, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I will let me, let me, so we can come back to these discussions again. Can I ask a question? And, yeah. Hello. Sure. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. My question was, are you doing something very different from calculating an S matrix element? No. Yeah. So it's, it's like, uh, it's like, um, Four, uh, four possible S matrix elements where three of them are kind of trivial and one of them is uh, coming uh, close enough. Yeah. So it's, it's very fine that the S matrix elements can be in a quantum superposition. 
Okay. So maybe there is one slide in the end which will make absolutely clear your point. Okay, but that's actually just the penultimate slide, I think. So it will be uh, you have to okay. wait a bit for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, okay. So now uh, this uh, justification of why the classical cannot entangle, okay, is is very. Very um, so I spent so much time in the justification because there's I guess here also I see there's a diverse audience. So for quantum information people, this is very very natural. Okay, so what happens? So I have assumed this local operations only possible. Okay, local operations are only possible because uh, the locality of physics and since uh, as 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 the points were just being made, we cannot. Of course, we cannot verify within our experiment anything relativistic. So we cannot prove the locality of physics. This we really have, this is an assumption for us that physics is local, okay? Interactions in nature are local. So again, not to be confused with quantum non-locality, this locality of uh, Hamiltonians and Lagrangians, okay? They are, they are local, okay? Now, if you have local operations, but you have only a classical effect going from one place to another, okay? Uh, classical field, which means it is something describable by a sequence of bits, maybe in finite sequence of bits, but uh, it is a fixed number. So they cannot, they cannot create a, a, a quantum entanglement. And this is very easily seen, okay? A classical field acting on an atom or any object will, for example, a fixed classical field will give a unitary operation. So there'll be a unitary operation there, a unitary operation here due to that, and a product state remains a product state. Okay, and you can of course generalize it also. You need not have unitary operation. You can have an ancillary system coming, getting entangled and tracing that out and measuring that. So you can have uh, more general operations. You generally can have uh, completely positive uh, maps on either side. But my point is that whatever they are, they will still be local, okay? Locality of physics will be have to be respected. They'll be local here and local there. And then, um, if you have only classical communication going between them, uh, you can very easily generalize this first line and show that if some states are what we call separable, not entangled before they remain entangled, uh, remain unentangled afterwards. Okay, so if you generate entanglement between two entities through any communication, and and remember, so I'm telling interaction between systems is a communication. Okay, interaction with the system is not action at a distance, but it is it is through something. So that is that is an assumption. Okay, so that from coming from the local locality assumption. So the so that if you you have to do that, then you require a quantum agent to go between. Okay, so with classical communication, this is the proof. Uh, this is the proof in quantum information that uh, you cannot entangle. Okay, one, I, I just want to ask one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do electron-electron scattering, for example, mm -hmm. then you're going to certainly get some virtual exchange of a photon, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now the question is, in that particular case, how does entanglement come in? Ah, right, right. You can and do how that. How does it come in here? Yeah, yeah. How so it's not, I can. Here? Yeah, yeah. So there, there you can have the entangling exactly as if you do a similar experiment. So you split an electron, say, with um, electron interferometer first, okay, uh, split another electron with the electron interferometer, and then you bring one of those components to scatter and don't bring the other ones, okay? So then the final state will become, uh, of the two electrons will become entangled, okay? So no one has particularly done this experiment with electrons, but people have done this with ions, uh, atoms, okay? This we do in ion trap quantum computing all the time, in fact. Uh, this is how ions are uh, entangled. Uh, so, so yeah. So this, this is this is uh, what you can uh, do. Um, now, historically, how we found out the nature of the electromagnetic field to be quantum was not through this route, because other things were easy enough to see. The lamp shift was, you know, observable. Okay? Uh, also, also photons in counters were clicking. Okay, this is very difficult for gravity. The graviton click to detect the graviton click and to detect the the. Uh, you know the lamp shift for gravity. These well, things lamp, are lamp shift is a different effect. Yeah, yeah. Now what I'm telling is that lamp those, shift is not a three, three level effect. No, no, no. So what? What? A I'm, lamp what shift I'm, is not a three level effect. 
No, 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 no. I completely agree with that. So what I'm telling is those effects are are not possible to detect here for gravity. That's why we are taking this route to detect it through the you know the the tree level effect. Okay, and we are detecting the quantumness of the tree level effect, the exchange, the quantumness of the exchange in the tree level effect. Okay, through this signature of entanglement. Now historically. Uh, other things were easy, other quantitative effects were easier to see for electromagnetism, while uh, it happens so for gravity that this other way seems to be easier to detect than to detect any uh, any loop for gravity or any, any, any higher order effects. Okay. So uh, I hope that is that is uh, clear. Okay, so the the entanglement. This is also another evidence of quantum nature of fields. But historically, we did not use this for electromagnetism because this experiment was very hard to do. This kind of experiment started only post 1996 uh, when Harosh first entangled two atoms through microwave uh, by flying them through cavities. Okay, so it's it's very recently that we got that technology. Otherwise, this is as good a proof of quantum nature. Uh, qualitative, like the superposition nature of uh, you know, quantum, but not not uh, will not give you any information about quantitative effects. Okay. Um, so now, okay. So I will, I will, I will uh, um, omit uh, history here. But so Feynman made some suggestions. To, to this extent in an old Chapel Hill uh, conference. We were not aware of that when we wrote our paper. Our paper was <laughs> independent, but there, he made some suggestions, a very similar experiment, but he, he, did, he was uh, using this old trick of trying to move masses here and there, which is, as I say, will be a very poor way to entangle. And then also, you know, entanglement was not in vogue that time. So he did not say what aspect. He said that if you did, uh, um, if you just moved one mass by superposing another mass, then yes. to describe everything, you will need quantum. But but he did not say what measurements. And and what we are telling is he will need measurements on both the masses. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's like a two particle interference, nothing but uh, entanglement. Okay. Now, uh, so so I I just just tell a little bit about why lesser experiments than entanglement will suffice. I don't think any lesser experiments will suffice because, for example, there's been a lot of suggestions uh, in the past of moving something to the left or something to the right, depending on, uh, you know, a superposition. Okay. Uh, but that is a classical stochastic theory. If the thing is left, you move left. If the thing is right, you move right. Okay. It doesn't verify the quantum coherence between the two options. Okay. So to verify that quantum coherence, I'm telling there's no, sh I, I don't know of any shortcut, shorter cut than to really very do a two particle uh, correlation experiment. Two particle correlation essentially is the interference. To get the interference for two particles, you really have to do two particle correlations. If you forget one, you just see uh, classical. classical. <laughs> um, right. So, now, uh, so so this uh, we spoke about some of these things. So uh, I I don't go into. I just wanted to say that other avenues to check uh, the the quantum uh, say corrections uh, or so so that that would be checking quantum corrections or or, or gravitons. Those are very hard. Okay? Just, just uh, I I uh, you know I I don't see any easy way to check for a nano Kelvin or nano electron volt of 0 0.01 energy deposited in a, in a like in a LIGO like a structure somewhere locally okay uh, or not locally I mean you be going to the whole structure so it's very difficult okay and also any corrections on the Newtonian will be at least in the power minus 34 times smaller okay you see already our work is like one second. Okay. So there's no hope for these things in the immediate future. This is why we are taking this track of trying to use the, the simplest uh, tree-level diagram, what often people call classical itself. Okay, We are uh, trying to see its underlying quantum nature, though people, it's, it's giving the, the well-known classical uh, magnitude, but qualitatively, it's a, it's a quantum effect we are exploring. <clears throat> 
now uh, okay so now uh, so how what are the two things we so it comes back to baskaran's question in the start okay how are we going to ever achieve this so i, I only described schematically okay uh, so the question is first how to create this kind of a large uh, superposition of a mass here and there and then how to detect this entanglement that we have created okay so so the normal technique that we normally use and has been used for for example for uh, nano uh, for 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 mi micromolecules uh, something like this has been used uh, is does not scale okay because uh, you if you need to use beam splitters what are beam splitters okay beam splitters are essentially potential barriers okay and you want a balanced beam splitter one by root 2 one by root 2 okay uh, uh, there's no hope of that with this micron size masses we are talking about okay this you have to make this potential so low and then on the left you have to have a well defined tail so the temperature has to become so low correspondingly here so that that you cannot really do this feasibly with uh, with uh, large masses okay so this is why the standard max zender doesn't work what you have to use so let me so so you have to use an ancillary system i just flag this because i did have this slide in my very first talk of my life uh, which was given in uh, in uh, in 1995 summer in uh, in math science um, uh, so this is just a historical uh, so there the ancillary system was neutrons and the mass being superposed was uh, like a crystal okay but let's not go into the details of this then then when i started my phd we went to the ancillary systems being photons and the mass to be like a movable mirror but lately we realized the best thing best ancillary system is a, a spin actually inside a, a, a nano crystal okay so a typical archetypal example is you have a have a diamond crystal with what is called the nv center defect inside okay this is a very popular thing for uh, as a qubit in quantum computation it happens to be a spin one but we can use any two of the levels for example and and i will just be calling them up and down or plus and minus for simplicity okay and say you have a crystal in a trap the crystal in arbitrary coherent state uh, um, say beta okay and the spin in initially in a state zero then at time t equal to zero you create a superposition of plus one and minus one you come with a microwave pulse you create a superposition of plus one minus one okay then what will happen for plus one there will be one well and for minus one there will be another well okay the well centers are shifted okay due to the okay so i i forgot to tell this how why are they shifted because we have kept a magnet nearby so the inhomogeneous field of the magnet acts like a stern girl like thing so for spin being uh, say plus 1 it shifts one way spin being minus 1 it shifts the other way okay and then this uh, particle oscillates in that well okay two wells and after one time period they come back so you finish a interferometer you start locally and you come back okay so using this ancillary system is pretty much i think the only way to uh, kind of uh, you know enact an interferometer for large objects okay and the thing we have in mind uh, really is for untrapped objects okay though in practice it appears that objects will anyway be become trapped due to say diamagnetism for example so so there is a trap also but consider them for free particles for the moment uh, this is just a standard like effect at 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 this point we start the the scheme we create a superposition of up plus down this is the stern girl like effect happening then at kind of correct time say a quarter of the time of the experiment we flip spins so the masses start to break okay they stop they turn around they speed up in the other direction and then we flip the spins again and there in the end we end the interferometer okay and then we will only measure the spins so we all we are doing we are never measuring a uh, the the path of the uh, the particles at all okay we are only going to prepare the spin initially in up plus down and then if we give a phase here we are going to find out that phase as up plus i phi down okay so it's really ramsey interferometry you just measure spins but in the middle you have the spins uh, you know taking the paths go to a standard like, okay so any phase you give on one path relative to the other will be recorded in the spin okay 
Uh, and this is just to show the robustness of such an effect to where it's you start. Doesn't matter, it's, it's a relative phase, okay? So if relative phase is same, uh, then it doesn't matter what thermal state you start from. So it's, it's incredibly robust to the initial thermal state. Now, uh, not so much for the gravity case, the, the spreads must not be much larger than the, the separations. Now, how will we do this gravity experiment is very similar to before the stern garlock interferometry. We will modify stern garlock interferometry slightly, okay? We will give them some shoulders so that these can parallelly fall and gather the gravitational field. Phases, okay. How we do that? We first create an electronic spin in up plus down superposition. Okay. Then we have the stern garlock effect here, stern garlock effect here. We flip spins to slow down and make them stop. Okay. So now no velocity. Okay. They are static next to each other, but then they are falling next to each other. And how, why, what do we do at this point? We map the uh, electronic spins by using the hyperfine interaction, they are mapped to nuclear spins, okay? Now, you know, the nuclear magneton is uh, like 10,000 times smaller. So, so they will just nothing happen. Yeah? They will just fall like that, okay? And then, uh, then when we again want to complete the interference experiment, we back, map back to electronic spins and we, uh, you know, we give a stern garlock field to bring them back, okay? Now, something very interesting happens when we are doing this ancilla, I, I can call this ancillary system aided interferometry, like the standard like interferometry. At the end of this, you will see the spins will become entangled. Okay? The entanglement which was supposed to happen between the masses are actually mapped to the spins. Okay, so this is, you have to repeat the same maths as I did before with every L being replaced by L up and every R being replaced by R down, okay? And when you do that, so this is also one of our uh, important findings, I think. So when you do that, at the end of the interferometry, when both the masses have come back to their center, let's call it C, okay? So first mass is in C1, the second mass is in C2, they have both come back, the spins get entangled. The spins embedded here, spin embedded here, okay? And this, makes it a very easy experiment. Now the entanglement you have to measure is the entanglement between spins, okay? And we are, people are, uh, not we, not I, but, but you know, humans, uh, uh, quantum computer scientists are experts at measuring correlation between two spins. It's very difficult to measure entanglement between two, two masses, but uh, this is fully mapped to between two spins automatically. And what one has to measure is uh, an, an, an entanglement richness, okay? If this entanglement weakness is less than, um, is negative, that means those masses are uh, entangled. So you have to measure the spin, the, the, both the masses have a spin embedded inside, which could be an envy center, uh, nitrogen vacancy center. And you have to just measure the correlation between the spins in different directions. And if you get that entanglement, if this weakness is violated, so this certifies the entanglement, then the entity which has gone between the masses Remember, my calculation was with direct Newtonian interaction at a distance, but I'm saying that it has an interpretation because of locality of physics through some exchange, and that exchange must have been quantum in order for these masses to be, uh, you know, get entangled. Okay. Now, uh, now some of the, the, the difficulties of uh, doing this, okay? So the main difficulty is what is called decoherence, okay? So, so the difficulty of the experiment is much less once you have one interferometer of this kind, okay? Then just placing things next to each other, maybe with some screening and stuff, it's, it's not terribly difficult, okay? Uh, the main thing is maintaining one of these quantum superpositions, okay, for such micron size objects. And what are the typical noise sources? So one thing is that, of course, you will have it in a container, okay? And the container will have some background gas. So the vacuum is never perfect, right? And the, the atoms uh, of the box, even at one Kelvin temperature, so suppose you, to helium temperature your whole box, okay, the atoms will still have a angstrom de Broglie wavelength, okay, and our superpositions, remember, are hundreds of microns. So an atom hitting, even one atom hitting the crystal will tell whether it's in the left or the right. So immediately decohere the full superposition, okay. So we want a vacuum where over one second, 
even one atom does not on average hit the crystal. Okay, so that vacuum is 5 in 10 power minus 16 pascals. Okay, uh, experimentalist standard experiments are typically horrified seeing that, right? But um, it has been achieved once. It has been achieved for penning traps by Jerry Gabriel say, uh, for penning traps. And, and this has been achieved uh, somewhere at least. Okay, And then the other enemy is that the mass itself will radiate. And now this is a, a priori, this is not so bad, you may think, because uh, when you pull a mass of this size to a Kelvin temperature, okay, um, internally, okay, of course, that I know is a challenge, but uh, that, that also has to be done in some way, okay. So it's pulled to a Kelvin temperature, then the, the black body radiation is like centimeters and things. So it will not decohere a prior superposition, but a number of them will. Okay, so you gather, go on gathering photons, it is one by square root of n effect. So if you gather n photons, you detect lambda by square root of n. So over time, it will reveal the position left or right. So we also require uh, this uh, one Kelvin of uh, temperature. And, and so if we achieve one Kelvin internal, no, sorry, yeah, 150 millikelvin internal temperature and, and this pressure, then this type of decoherence is gone. Okay, there's another type that your apparatus is subjected to random masses outside, accelerating it left and right. Okay, and you see these things are exceptional accelerometers, means they are very bad. They are so they, they, it means very also very bad to unknown accelerations. You see, so 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 we we have to uh, so. For the kind of masses we will be using, uh, you know, uh, this kind of accelerations uh, can uh, kill the coherence. Okay, coherence means will happen randomly, and we will not know what spin basis to choose to see the correlations. Okay, so that can be done by putting the whole experiment, including the apparatus. So these magnets which are controlling it, and the final laser which will probably read out this uh, NV centers, they must all fall for this one second, okay? Then you get rid of all accelerations by, by of course, the equivalence principle. Of course, uh, in practice, we have to think a bit better. We, we should try to do this uh, maybe with LIGO technology with springs and various combination of springs like a pendulum and have the experiment demand ration. So, but, but real free fall is what we just calculated with, okay? But of course, there will still be the effect. We have this 100 microns, so depending on where this mass is, there will be the curvature effect, okay? So there will be a different relative acceleration, which we cannot, we cannot get rid of the relative acceleration in a free falling lift. That appears as an extra harmonic potential, okay? Uh, so to get rid of that, we have to still have an exclusion zone, okay? So I leave this part, which is about the jitter from the things, uh, gas hitting the capsule in which we do free fall. It's too technical. I just want to show you things like, uh, you know, planes things are far enough anyway. So humans kind of have to be um, five meters away and things like that. Uh, humans also can walk uh, jerky manner or smooth manner. Uh, so all these data we know from, from LIGO because they are subject to acceleration noise. And we just have to divide that by this factor the scale of our experiment by the distance from source square, okay? So our experiment is very small compared to LIGO. So, so it's, there's a huge damping, but we still need an exclusion zone from any, any creatures or animals. If, if we have to do it on uh, Earth, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so screening can be done. Maybe I am running out of time. So I, I, I don't know, I mean, also this is a bit technical thing. If you have screening, you can bring things um, a bit closer, which means you can also make the superpositions a bit smaller and things like that, okay? Um, screening is not a panacea. Why? Because uh, this, the force with the screening element can become so large that you won't be able to complete your interferometry. Okay, so the, the, it is not all, all that easy, but we can do a little bit. Uh, these are, as I said, so, so now coming back to 
if we have created such um, superpositions, they are also exceptional sensors for classical gravity. Okay, so they are meter scale gravitational wave detectors essentially. Okay, uh, but when we achieve that kind of pressure and temperature, as I was telling, and interferometry, they will also detect gravitational waves uh, with uh, meter scale box. But of course, they will detect it in a, we have a second experiment. So they will not detect the things which LIGO detects. This is more like they will detect things which LISA tries to detect. So low frequency gravitational waves, okay? But not gravitons, okay? They will detect like, you know, zillions of gravitons together to have the effect. Okay? Uh, now, okay, so this is uh, probably more technical. Uh, this is also a bit technical, but so one can try to see if you have multiple, um, so Q dips rather than Q bits. So you have multiple things, then you can also uh, have some robustness to decoherence. Okay? When you have Q dips, you also detect more complicated observables. To detect the entanglement of two uh, Q dips, you need all the SUD, SUD generators, okay? You, you, cannot, um, uh, you cannot just measure uh, spins, like SU2 things. So, so uh, you have to measure more operators, but there is much more robustness to decoherence, okay? So these are, again, I think more technical work. Um, uh, maybe this is, I also skip this. This is part of the logic. This is something I've repeated again and again, but maybe what I want to show, what I want to emphasize is in the middle bit, there is the, uh, you know, the, uh, this has the field as well, okay? When we get this interaction, Coulomb interaction, we are projecting the, the, the gravitational field to vacuum initially and finally. It's not excited, but, it's a second order perturbation theory. So in the, in the middle, there is a quantum superposition and this is the aspect we are very fine. So you have a coherent interaction only if this part is, uh, you know, quantum, okay? And uh, maybe, so again, because some questions arose in the middle about the higher order terms, okay? So these are not the quantum terms, these are the relativistic terms, okay? So these are the post-Newtonian terms from relativity, okay? So, here I can probably uh, answer uh, Professor Dattis' question uh, a bit more clearly. So what happens is, of course, as you see, instead of gm squared, that gets multiplied by a, a v squared by c squared term and v4 by c4 term, essentially, okay? Uh, but those are there. Again, these are not on-shell processes. These are due to exchange of virtual spin two, okay? Uh, like this is the virtual spin zero. So. Um, now, uh, I mean, we computed values. I mean, these are, are really difficult for us. I mean, I'll be very happy. I, I, I mean, it's worth checking if you make the crystal a bit smaller, whether you can go to so high a speed as to, to get any of these terms. But, you know, we haven't been successful in that. Okay. Now, but qualitatively, if you could, you know, qualitatively, these states do have a difference. When you go to this V4 by C4 term, the kind of entangled state you generate is qualitatively different and that will show a spin two signature because what will happen is say say expand, say consider these masses to be harmonic oscillators and the momentum is expanded as a, a minus a dagger, for example. So, so the if you took harmonic oscillator masses, the Newtonian term, you know, and you take small, the second order is just a X1, X2 spring coupling, okay? Uh, it's not a very good scenario to do the experiment, but one can do that. Then you get two more squeeze states or one, what one can call a square root of a thermal state, okay? Um, uh, the thermophile double state, variously called uh, states, uh, typical like zero, zero plus R one, one plus R squared two, two. While if you have these terms, you will have zero, zero plus R squared two, two. You will reduce, it'll jump the one, one, okay? And then you'll get the four, four. So there is a signature of the, the tensor na nature here also, but again, we yeah, are not in that regime, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'll skip these two things. Uh, this is more recent work. We are trying to show that whether spinless things work or not, okay? Uh, anyway, this is a set of papers that we have written in the topic. We have written a few more, actually. This is a collection of some of them. <coughs> I have a theory PDRA position. It's just a one-year position, unfortunately, but it's uh, available. 
to collaborate with some experimentalists on uh, um, you know the experimental um, thing is is really miles to go uh, so i and with the first question that baskar uh, professor baskar was asking me there is still miles to go because uh, one had uh, what people have cooled these nano crystals but um, but first first our first task in this project will be to get a picometer superposition for a um, uh, nanometer sized uh, as a virus sized crystal you know uh, nano diamond uh, yeah thank you very much for your attention and uh, i'm happy to answer uh, more questions yeah. oh the picture i wanted to show has not come in the end uh, with the penultimate picture that I, I i can probably draw that picture it somehow has not Oh, that picture is not there in the end, uh, which would have been the answer to Professor Sony's question. But I can I can draw something uh, when when uh, when I come to that. But maybe I first answer. I see part part. Uh, uh, part two. Uh, you can ask question. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, get your feedback on something. Uh, uh, sometime around 2015, I think there was some work which proposed that. Uh, there is an universal uh, you know uh, way of uh, decoherence uh, through uh, because of the gravity through time dilation so when the system mass in uh, system bigger uh, becomes bigger or mass increases then because of the self gravity and the time dilation effect it will automatically decohere so right, i was wondering right, if right. you have any comments on that and in the context especially in the context yeah. of your yeah 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 i will i will tell you that so let me actually try to share one uh, some uh, this is zoom right so i can probably very uh, it is it is um if i have the the chance to share oh i think i should stop this share then i can start to share uh, it, it helps to write a bit but i, I i'll 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 uh, yeah mm, i'll tell you about that so so that so of course we should be concerned about that kind of decoherence uh, killing our experiment but not really because what happens is that for that experiment you need some conditions also so you need uh, many oscillators inside okay which are um, uh, starting in uh, non eigen states okay and uh, then their uh, oscillation frequency so in say take many phonons and things uh, inside right uh, and then uh, you are doing the experiment it say if you are doing it in in different potentials compared to earth okay uh, then those and, and you have to start those phonons in a kind of non eigen states right so then they will evolve and the the when you bring the masses back after interference they will be in say say different states uh, these phonons would have had different evolution equal to the gravitational you know time dilation they will have slightly different frequencies and they will result in a in a decoherence here okay now this is um, i think so this effect so what we will do essentially is we will cool our crystal to say you know to about uh, you know it's a micron size crystal right speed speed of sound is uh, what 3000 uh, meters per second so so essentially giga um, uh, nano nano crystal so i think crystals are like the lowest phonon is uh, here is uh, 10 gigahertz okay so i think we can just pull it to the the ground state of all the all the internal phonons uh, pretty easily because this is a very small crystal okay the um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, i don't, don't think this kind of um, uh, even to see this effect i think you have to uh, engineer um, you have to create initially by some quench or something a non non eigen states to so it's a it's a thing which i my opinion is that a doesn't harm our experiment b to see it you need very hot temperatures and and the number of uh, phonon modes and also them to be starting in uh, you know not in eigen states so if you start in a thermal state you're fine uh, because they are all combinations of uh, you know uh, eigen states yeah. so that is my opinion uh, on that okay um but it is so a interesting is it, uh, effect and uh, it is quite prominent if you engineer conditions uh, appropriately yeah yeah i mean uh 
just a clarification was that proposal did it mean that uh, only due to self gravity there will be a decoherence irrespective of any uh -huh. other sorry i may have been telling you about the wrong paper so this paper i think <laughs> is with pikowski and bruckner so it is not due to self gravity it's about is due to gravitational time dilation acting differently on a, on a system with lots of internal modes and those internal modes have to start in a non eigen state here and have like different dynamics so internal clocks ending up being uh, i see on non non orthogonal so it's like a interference of uh, a twin paradox kind of interference yeah. uh, so what who are the authors you mentioned you just mentioned this one this one i think is pikowski uh, pikowski bruckner these people so it appeared it is it is a it is an interesting paper no doubt and and the effect can probably be seen what i'm telling is in our case it uh, we calculated is it is not a okay. major effect um, and in fact if you start in a thermal state i don't see how you can do that you have to really start in non eigen states uh, now you can say systems of course will not remain in eigen uh, there can be small kicks and things from the environment and things but uh, i think still the effect is very it increases with the number of oscillators okay? that is one effect now what you are talking about self gravity i am not that much aware of that literature but um, uh, that would is that done more in newton schrodinger con context i guess uh, i may do something yeah like i mean that. i i'm not uh, very sure i don't remember all the details but what i remember is roughly speaking is because because of the self gravity uh, uh, the, uh, the definition of time is changing over space okay. like so the okay. because uh, that that time dilation effect changes the phase and therefore it decoheres and uh, if the system size is large enough then it will be become a classical object uh, mm. uh, without any background noise or anything ah yeah. so even just, purely from within gravity yeah, right, yeah right. within just gravity yeah that's right so that is that's, the main point of the work i think but i don't remember is, the details okay. i did not that follow is, it yeah that is interesting so again i will i i a priori i would say that that time scale is probably much longer than ours but i have to check yeah i, I don't yeah okay 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 about, fine uh, thank you part, yeah the things we have checked for example is say of course this experiment is done with uh, you know feasible accelerations in magnetic field gradient so uh, so the gravitational wave emission that will happen when we are accelerating oppositely okay that effect is also it does not decohere our system okay at all okay um, um also things like neutrinos obviously don't decohere our system but, but gravitational waves are are kind of also nearly that bad at decohering our so is pretty well isolated system for the kinds of accelerations we are uh, giving okay uh while we are uh, you know uh, doing the experiment okay um <clears throat> now uh, another another aspect maybe since i have drawn this picture it's worth emphasizing that historically long ago there is this colella overhauser werner experiment okay this is very famous okay this was done with neutrons but this was first time people saw an effect of gravity classical gravity on a quantum system so maybe it's worth emphasizing how our experiment is different is that it's kind of we are putting the earth also in a superposition the other mass also in a superposition so my point is that when only ma one mass one mass is not in a superposition the other is in a superposition you can have a classical field fixed classical field and still get the phase while when you put this first mass in superposition as well then you cannot have that uh, explanation unless you accept there's a superposition of two different uh, you know classical gravitational fields okay nice. so nice. so so this is the qualitative difference uh, so no one particularly asked me this question but i i kind of clarify this because this is something probably good to put in a in a slide that how this differs from that and then maybe also i will draw one picture which um Uh, in response to professor uh, say sony's question some time ago is yeah uh, can i ask this question once more 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now there, there are three things. Sorry, I I need an education here because I haven't been following all this. Uh, yeah. That you need a virtual uh, exchange, which is quantum. You need a superposition also, which is quantum, and you seem to need also an entanglement. Now, can yes. you can you, can you just define the roles of these three things? Yeah, very very good question. Okay. So let me let me exactly draw this uh, picture, which unfortunately I don't have. I made a nice slide, but let me let me just draw that uh, picture. That will make the thing clearer. Okay. So, uh, this is one of them. Then the other is. Um, Sorry, so let me put it like that. Okay, so left, right, left, right. Okay, then okay. So okay, so so actually, so I, I've just drawn this for the pointers. I I should not really they they that is not a okay. So let me uh, so that I don't forget the positions. Okay. So then we have, um, so let's uh, call, um, so um, uh, R, L, then, uh, There's also a plus here, and then here we have the L and uh, the, sorry, we did that here already, right? So, so this is why it's a bit difficult to draw. Okay, so R and L there, and here we have uh, the other one is uh, R R. Oh, RR. RR. This is RR. And then we have uh, LL somehow. Okay, LL. So this is the scenario here, okay, that we are having. We, having, we are creating a mass in a superposition, two masses in superposition, so that there are four options. Yeah, RR, LL, LR, and RL. Okay. And then this is the, the exchange, uh, you know, uh, taking place. Okay. Uh, and uh, the the so you see the the so in 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 um, in uh, some sense okay the the starting point and the ending point of this virtual graviton okay so if we say this is like xr and xl okay is in in superposition so it's 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 different okay so it has to be an entity which can uh, be in a superposition from uh, you know propagating between uh, different uh, points okay let alone that it also has to be a superposition over energies but it also has to be a superposition over uh, you know the its um, uh, initial and final point okay and that is the kind of um, quantum character that we are uh, finding out now the role of the different things okay the role of the mass in the superposition is that say say if the mass was not in a superposition we will have exactly one of these diagrams okay and if you have exactly one of these diagrams then in in this particular example okay there is no uh, entanglement okay if uh, you know, of course, you know, the, the, say, for example, if two electrons were scattering this way with the internal degree of freedom, like uh, the spin, and the electrons were indistinguishable, you, you can get entanglement from uh, electron scattering. So they can come in, uh, in up and down, end up in a singlet, things like that. Okay. But that is uh, not the, the, the scenario here because these masses are still uh, very, you know, distinguishable uh, masses. Okay, so so the only way to create the uh, entanglement is to have all these four uh, things superposed and gather different phases. Okay, so what will happen classically? Classically, kind of any one of these four things will stochastically happen, but that is one of the um, scenarios which 
corresponds to a classical description. So the mass left or right will collapse to right or left and create a classical gravity left or right. So only when one of those realities will happen, then there's no point, point of a phase difference between them. Okay. So even the, the accumulation of phase difference makes sense when you have these uh, options uh, superposed with each other. Okay. So, so the interaction uh, uh, plays the role over some time to, to gather this phase difference. That's the role of the interaction. Okay. Uh, the role of the initial state of the masses is that it allows you to generate the entanglement. Otherwise, you will have roughly one of these four options, which is not an entangled state. Okay. Two masses flew in, they flew out. Okay. Uh, now, the, the, this, uh, you may ask, what is the role of the vertex? Here, okay. So here, the the vertex, the role is it's, it's kind of assumed. Okay. So we are assuming this structure where we are not assuming uh, we are we, uh, this one. We are not assuming that it is quantum or classical. Okay. So let me draw another uh, picture. Okay. So this one, the incoming and outgoing particles, we are assuming to be quantum. Yeah. We are putting them in quantum superposition. And then we are assuming that it has a vertex, but we are not committing to whether that vertex is quantum or classical. Okay, this is the question we are asking. Okay, and that question can be verified by by this kind of experiment. If the vert, if the thing, uh, if the if the boson coming out of that vertex was classical, okay, then you will not get this, um, you know, coherent. In what I would call coherent interaction. If it was classical, it has to have some value, which means it has to have coming from some source. So it will be corresponding to one of those four things. Okay. So this is uh, one way to uh, explain the thing. Is, is that clear enough or still some questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the figure I had was better than what I've drawn here, but uh, it's, it's essentially the thing. So in this we are. In this diagram, your uh, wavy line represents Hj that you tried to define earlier, right? Uh, yeah, the wavy line is the uh, H. Um, it, 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 so Hj would be roughly each one of those configurations. Mm -hmm. see. So while uh, we are quantum superposing them rather than probabilistically having uh, one of those four things. So, so in, in that description I gave uh, would be that with quarter probability, you have this. With quarter probability, you have that. Those are the PJs and the corresponding HJs. Okay, so it's like a mass centered here, you know, creates a gravity centered there. A mass centered there creates a gravity centered there with, with different probabilities. And then when you have different options with different probabilities, doesn't even make sense to have a uh, you know a quantum phase between superposed components, right? So so. So that is the classical uh, gravity. Yeah. So classical. So that's one way to understand why the classical gravity will not give uh, an entanglement. Okay. So Shugato, Shugato, mm -hmm. one more yes, question. Yes. Maybe we'll have to end. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, Shugato, uh, mm -hmm. I have heard about uh, double slit experiment with C sixty mm -hmm. molecules and yeah, also yeah, bigger. Yeah. Uh, molecules involved in several amino acids and so on, some small proteins. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, can you think of your uh, effect in that context, like uh, some yeah. two particle interference beyond? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so essentially, the, the work is very much inspired by those experiments, right? So that the, those are those are the the best uh, achievements that I was talking about. So those are these ten to the power four atoms are those uh, long uh, amino acid uh, molecules which people have uh, interfered. Now, the 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 gravitational effect is, as you know, is proportional to m square, or, or, or in uh, right m one m two in, in my notation. So that there is where the problem lies. So those experiments are very good. Uh, they definitely inspire us to go further in mass. But uh, before we go to um, you know micron-sized uh, crystals, you know we do not uh, have uh, a, a one even a one hertz experiment. So so that just that the the time you need to make them interact 
to have sufficient entanglement will just go up uh, hugely. Uh, that's the thing. Of course, they will also gravitationally interact, uh, just that they will be weaker by uh, almost uh, 10 orders. The mass is weaker by 10 orders each. So, it'll be, so we will require 10 to the power 20 seconds to entangle two such things. Uh, this is why we want to scale up, but definitely the thing is inspired by those. We, we go to the, try to go to the next step and then we, we try. That, that then has the application that uh, gravity can entangle uh, in a second time scale. Okay, so maybe we should so, stop here. Uh, I just wanted to ask one yeah. more final question if, sure. if there is any, yeah. okay, enough time. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Sure. I just wanted to make sure if this following statement would be right. So in your, if your experiment gives positive result, then one has to assure that neutralization is perfect. And if it, is, yeah. if it gives negative result, then one has to ensure that there hasn't, hasn't been any decoherence. That is true. That is true. So uh, when you, if you have a negative result, which will, of course, will be a big surprise <laughs> to anyone. So, so uh, a negative result will be like the Michelson-Morley experiment. Like everyone, even I, because it's just an interaction, you know, we have done very straightforward quantum, uh, straightforward calculation based, based on known things. So if we don't get any entanglement and, and we go on checking all decoherence sources and, and still do not find anything which is... is uh, Simon. Not uh, you know decohering. I mean that is of course concretely it is uh, um, somewhat easy to check. Uh, you you check with the individual interferometer first. I mean the other way that whether the coherence is there, and then if you bring in two of them, you still do not get entanglement. I would be very surprised. I would almost not know what theory to replace it with. But people have kind of stochastic theories, uh, like the one I was talking about roughly. People have some concrete theories like that, where uh, you would probably uh, have to, then, then gravity would be very different from all the other forces we know. Yeah. Uh, which we, of course, know is very different, but, but, uh, but it will not be quantum. That is, that is very, very. So we, if, the, if the result is positive, will it imply that? Uh, Measuring quantum gravity effects is easy. No, 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 not, <laughs> not, no, no. It would, it would just uh, rule out any um, any chance of semi-classical gravity being correct. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, I don't know of any good logical arguments. So, if of course, if there was a strong logical argument over over ruling semi-classical gravity, where Gra gravity is classical and uh, matter is quantum. Okay, I still don't know of a very convincing logic. People have it in their mind that it must not obviously be true because there is no model, exact model like that, okay, uh, which is consistent. Uh, but but no one can show that. So in fact, there are some models which their uh, creators think are are consistent. Okay, uh, I haven't gone to the details to see that. I know some models are inconsistent such as Newton Schrodinger uh, equation, because obviously nonlinearity, deterministic nonlinearities lead to faster than light signaling, but there are stochastic models. Okay? And so uh, it, will, it will just rule out any classical uh, gravity and quantum, uh, all, all other forces being quantum. So gravity also has to be quantum, but it is just a binary answer, yes, no, where actually the no is very difficult to conclude because you really have to get rid of all decoherence, which is always a very big challenge. Okay, um, so I, I don't even know whether it's right to call it a binary answer. It's a yes and inconclusive. Probably is the best thing. Okay, to say. but yeah, but if self gravity decoheres, then you wouldn't need any uh, other theory to explain why there is no. Um, yeah. Why there is no entanglement? I mean, why gravity is classical? Right. Because, okay, yes. okay, yeah, that's why. So in a cell gravity, cell gravity decohering, if that's a consistent relativistic uh, theory, then those are the theories we'll be left with. Uh, okay, know, okay, okay, okay. Nice, thank you. So, got though, yes. uh, just a yeah. piece of yeah. information, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Simon, whom you were alluding to, right now right. he's flying, he's ah, flying from uh, Doha to. Cincinnati okay. or uh, somewhere. 
So that's why he couldn't come. Okay, no, no, no problem. Yeah, right yeah. Now, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. No, I have very fond memories of my first uh, visit uh, that time. So, yeah. so I think there were a group. I think there were very, very few Bengali people, two, three other Bengali people. So we went out for. Um, sometimes we went out outside for food i remember and then then also otherwise i i liked very much the campus uh, the the food and and the stay and, okay uh, yeah so i think oh, first time i saw archive in math yeah, science yeah. first time i yeah. saw archive yeah i think you should come here after some time you know in, and the other memory i have was was during the conference you were referring to when yeah, there right, was right. Uh, you know we got there yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you very much Pleasure. for yeah. such you. a wonderful talk and with patience of answering questions. So, yeah, so with this, we'll conclude this session. Thank you again. Sure. Bye. Bye.